And Tim, guess what? What's that? We are live with This Your Six Covered and Tim Davis. Hopefully you guys are having fun. I see there's some of you out there already. So let's get a little crazy. Hopefully the tea is kicking in because about 30 minutes ago, I didn't want nothing to do with this, but I do now. I do now. So cheers, Tim. You know, you're drinking tea. Was it, was it last night you were drinking water? Yeah. yeah. I was trying that H2O stuff and I was trying to drink it before I went to bed because lately I've been laying in bed going, man, I drank too much tea. But what's up, Range? Jerry Parker. Car Kane's out there. Car Kane's got an awesome topic, actually. What's that? What's he got? Are you familiar with Freedom Week California had uh, a while back? Uh, no. Oh, is this about the uh, where the judge threw out the uh, requirement for background checks? No, this was for uh, large capacity magazines, large capacity with the thing, standard capacity magazines, 30 round mags. And uh, there was a, like a week and a half ish where people were going nuts. They had the ability to go out and buy as much mags as they could. But now we got 1.5. So uh, Car Cannon and put that up there in the comment section. California Freedom Week. And I don't know much about it, but basically the Ninth Circuit Court. I guess either didn't agree, they either agreed to something for a little bit or not, but uh, that's pretty cool. So we'll see. Talking Rocks out there, how you doing? I did have to make some sweet tea. No, honestly, I didn't because I'm actually at a third. So we'll see how this chat goes. But Brian Marks, how you doing? Can you see the comments, Tim? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm watching them in the, okay. on the YouTube. Uh, the Sharpie Challenge. I'm glad yeah. you guys are watching. That that was pretty funny. So I, I have to ask that one where Ray, you know, he's like calls a shot, right? And, yeah. and nails it. And all the other ones he kind of met, you know, hit around. Was he was he able to actually do it every time and and then just uh um, yeah, that was that was straight up. He started screwing with this pin, right? So yeah. I don't have actually I, no, I don't have one, but it has it's a sharpie, but then it has a little button on it, right? Okay. And we had a uh, in their center of their kitchen, not their kitchen, their dining room table. There's like I don't know five or six empty uh, like old style bottles. And uh, he's over here and he's trying to shoot this pin, you know. And I'm like, oh, make it inside of the thing. And then we had to use this little candle to get the right height because there was no way it would go up. Doesn't have enough spring in it. And uh, <laughs> He was getting pretty close, so I'm like, okay, well, let's make this a game. So I grabbed my camera, which is really just my phone, and uh, I recorded it. No, that happened exactly how you saw it. It, it kind of seemed like when he was so confident on that last shot that maybe the other ones he was he was just kind of goofing around on. No, no, he had never made it until then. And the best part was where he says my daughter made it. When Ray left, it was – uh, Ray's daughter and his wife was there and uh, I'm all, you know, basically, so he didn't hear me, but basically we're going pretend, you know, and we'll make a bunch of noise. And uh, he goes in the other room and we're like, yeah, she got it. All this stuff. So he thought, he thought, you know, she had gotten it. So she, he was really trying really hard to get this thing. And uh, it was funny because there's no way he could have done it any better. And yeah. he turns to the camera, he's like, I'm X-ring, it's shking, and he makes it in there. And I was like, Holy shit. Yeah. I'm like, I can't believe it. I, I don't know if you saw my um my comment. I said something about playing quarters. And I, I don't know. I I don't know if that was a uh if that's kind of a colloquial thing here in the Midwest or no, we played quarters in California a lot back okay. then. Yeah, so that, that kind of reminded me of playing quarters, and I'm like well, heck, I should teach my kids how to play, just not let them know there, there's alcohol involved. There you go. Get them ready. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I guess one of the best things you can do as a parent is yeah, get teach them ready. Kids I, how to, I remember teaching my kids how to play poker years ago, and they really enjoyed it, you know. And then and we haven't played in forever, but I figured, hey, these are things that, you know, my mm -hmm. son's going to go off to college or whatever and end up getting – Someone's going to say, hey, let's play poker. And when you don't know how to play poker, you're the sucker at the table, right? So why not teach your kid not how to be the sucker? So, Absolutely. 
<coughs> Let's jump back over here. We got Bad Billy, Robert Warren, Mano, Brian DeShane. We did I miss Jerry Parker. Let me go back down. Joaquin, DW, and we got Eric's here. Okay, so let's read some comments. What's up, fellas? He did make it look like he was a pro, the range said. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. And he just – he didn't even look in the cup, which was the best part of the whole thing. I was like, dang. I thought he – he has a remarkable shot. Let's see. Hey, Billy. What part of the Midwest are you from, Tim? Uh, yeah, I see. I see that with Brian. I'm. I'm actually. I live in Indiana myself, and uh, so I'm. I'm uh, halfway between Indianapolis and Bloomington. Okay. Eric says, if you pass that, I can draw on you with a sharpie. <laughs> Can't <laughs> afford a sharps rifle, so I'll have to get a sharpie rifle. There you go, Carcane. Yep. Yeah, I was hoping that thing would go big. We needed some uh, – I was hoping some people would, would uh, grab it on Facebook and post it, see if we can get some looks. Blue Healer 260s out there. So I was going to have fun, and luckily Tim Davis showed up because – where's my phone at? Um, I figured it'd be kind of – it'd be kind of fun. My brain is smoked today, Tim. I – Opened up a 3,000 piece puzzle today, and me and my daughter tried messing with it. And the yeah. pieces are like this big, and the thing is four feet long by 30 inches or something. It's a it's ridiculous. Oh, wow! So, and it's too tough. I, I'm not a guy that likes to quit anything, but I keep looking at this thing going, Man, I'm gonna just scoop it back into the dam. So, we separated all the ends and then. <laughs> We didn't. We we thought we got them all. We started putting the edges together, and there was like fourteen pieces we missed. So then we had to go through another cycle of trying to find the ends. It took all day, and we didn't get anywhere. Yeah, I have I have fond memories uh, as a kid. Um, I think you and I, Rick, are we're, we're just a few months apart. But growing up in the seventies or whatever, and going to the family on the holidays, and all uh, everywhere there was a puzzle. You know, at each one of the the houses and it'd just be like some people would just walk in, work on it for a little bit. Walk yeah. it, I, I don't see that anymore, but uh, I don't know. If many, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if many families. Uh, I remember as a firefighter in the early nineties, I used to bring puzzles to work and uh, there was this one like extra table. There's a big like dining room table style kind of table sitting up against the wall. And I'd, I'd pour it out, and I'd put it there, and I'd work on it a little bit. But as the shifts went through, if they got bored or whatever, you know, because at night you're basically waiting for the next call, um, you know, people will work on it. Before you know it, a puzzle will be done, and then I'll throw another one up there. And, uh, it's, you know, it's something to do. So when you were uh... – Still in the in the firehouse as a regular firefighter, were you doing like a twenty four on four day off or? When I worked for the state of California, well, at the time it was called uh, California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, and then um, years later, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger came in. And I think he couldn't say all that shit, so he actually called it Cal Fire. So now now the patch just says Cal Fire on it. Um, but the shift I had there was we would work three days on. Well, when I real when I started the, as a seasonal, we worked four days on, three days off. Did that for a little bit, and then when you get picked up, then you're working three days on, four days off. And then when I went to my other department, uh, we actually worked two days on and four four days off. So it depends. I went I went from a large scale municipal department to a smaller scale municipal department. And we did, uh, we had a different shift. It's called a 4896. Hmm. So you, when you were on, you were, you were living in the firehouse for the, the 48 hours. Yeah. You'd bring, you'd bring a bag and it'd have, you know, it'd have all your uniforms or they would be in your locker depending on, if you had a, like a relief shift where you had to bounce from house to house and then, uh, but yeah, you'd have your towel and all your shaving crap and 
basically all that stuff. And then food, depending on what house you're at, you would either everybody pitch in money and we go buy something, or if you're at a really busy house, um, you would just basically grab food as you could at some fast food shop. So, you know, you grab a burger or something or whatever the case is. And no. half the time, well, not half the time, but there was a time when I worked at a really busy place. Um, and it was like, <laughs> if you even got your food if, before the call, uh, you'd be eating that shit on the way to a call because you needed to get some type of food in you before the next call. Um, the last place, the place that I worked at the uh, last where I was 21 years, we, that was a lot slower than the old days of working in a big city. So, yeah, round round here. Well, actually, I take that back. Most of the fire departments here, unless you're out in the county, uh, are are paid now. But uh, but even up in like in and around Indianapolis, uh, the Indianapolis Fire Department itself was a paid fire department, but all the townships were were mostly mostly volunteer, but I think somewhere probably ten years ago or so that all kind of incorporated in, under Indianapolis Fire Department um, town I live in. There, it's a paid department, but you get out into the townships and they're they're still volunteer. Yeah, and I got to give those guys a lot of kudos. Um, starting out as a volunteer, um, you know, I always remember my roots are where I started. Uh, a lot of people don't, you know, once they become a professional paid firefighter, they kind of mock the uh, volunteers and that's really not the case there's a lot of people throughout the country uh, that spend a lot of time away from their family to go to training classes and to do all this stuff to help the community that they're uh, living in so it's a it's an awesome thing and uh, for people you know it's a great job rewarding and all and you got elster here we're talking about uh actually tim's giving me questions so we're just talking about fire department right now but it's been kind of good. It's been a lot of fun. It's been an enjoyable career for sure. I, uh, so I, I went to uh, shipboard firefighting school when I was in the Navy and, uh, I, I, I will never ever begrudge anybody that, that, that is a firefighter. And, uh, I, I think if, if I had to go to that, you know, the fear factor game, uh, going back into a bilge fire would probably be my, my, my biggest fear. Those are all fires because there's no ventilation. No, well, and so in in the trainer, uh, you know, you're walking in waist deep in in uh, water uh, with fuel oil sitting on top of it, and they they just light that up, and you go from you know you have Scott Air Pack on, you can barely see to mm -hmm. nothing because it, it's just pitch black immediately as soon as the fuel. And uh, I, I froze up, and the instructor's standing right next to me, and he, you know, he's he's uh he reaches over and he grabs the nozzle. You know, and he's just like up and down, up and down, left and right. <laughs> yeah. You know, finally, you know, you get, you, get, you know, I'd, I'd rather have bullets zing past my head again than, than do that. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a fun job. It's definitely fun. The best job you can have in the fire service is being a truck captain. That is, that is my, that was my favorite position in the, in the fire service for sure. Um, you get a little bit of a, uh, you know, you're the supervisor of your crew. You don't have to worry about politics and uh, all that kind of stuff. All you got to do is basically make sure your crew's safe and find stuff to do for the day, which is training and uh, working out and figuring out what's for lunch and what's for dinner and all that kind of stuff, right? And it's a yeah. great position for sure. Someone had a question what it takes to be a fire volunteer firefighter. Um, the only answers I can give you guys is it was a long time ago when I did it. So, um, it was 31 years ago was when I was a volunteer fireman. The, uh, the answers will probably be the same throughout the nation for the most part, but the best thing to do is to, to go to your local, uh, volunteer fire department, sit down and talk to them and ask them what the requirements are. You're going to have to take classes. Some of that will be on the job training. Most of that will probably be at some type of uh, college-funded class of some sort, meaning uh, you know you're going to get credits for it as well and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's just like your state-certified class, or depending on what state you're in, could be a little different. But for the most part, just go go down there. Don't be scared, and uh, you know, ask them what it takes to become a new volunteer firefighter. 
you will have to go to some type of medical class, whether it's EMT or I don't even know if they have first responder anymore. Uh, most everybody in California is all EMT as a minimum and then paramedic and so on. But one of my son-in-laws is a captain in his town's fire department. That's cool range. Here's Sharpie Jumper. What's up, Sharpie <laughs> Jumper? What's <laughs> Sharpie Jumper? What you doing, Sharpie Jumper? Oh, porch, like I'm always doing. That's right. I didn't even talk to you today. How you been, fool? Oh, man, crazy busy, crazy busy. That's cool. What's up, Joaquin? Working on those suppressors. I got you. I'm not a firefighter, but I can pee. There you go, DW. Oh, That's half oh the yeah. I, I, I can do that, too. <laughs> What's up, yeah. Range? Yeah, Ray, Ray don't have to pee much, but when he does, <clears throat> I hope you got a while. You're going to be waiting a while. <laughs> Did I ever tell you how good this company was? Defender Ammunition Company. No, but you probably should. Did they, did they have a pallet of uh, ammunition on your porch today? Uh, no, that's tomorrow, actually. <laughs> okay. They are good people. They really are, and they make great ammunition. I've been shooting them for five years now, I guess. Five years? Yeah, about five years, and they are um, veteran-owned and operated uh, out of Rayford, North Carolina. Just great, great group of people. Uh, can't say enough good stuff about them. I try not to ever sound like commercials, but I felt like it since I saw it in the the, the camera. Yeah, it's on there. That's for sure. I was going to say something, and I forgot what it was. Yeah, the range is talking about the Charge Master. There's, it's on sale for two eighty nine through. I can't ever say this right. Natchez. Is that how you say it? Natchez. What's up, Todd? Natchez. And the range. Uh, no, I don't have six millimeter. Uh, there's something else coming in. <laughs> oh, this is a good question. Robert Warren's got a good one. Uh, and this will be for Rick as well because I mentioned it to him. But his question is, what do you recommend, small primer or large primer for the 6.5 Creedmoor? Uh, you can typically, what I've seen is, and I've tried them both, is if you're going to run it hot, it's better to use the small primer, less chance of it blowing out. We haven't done much testing on that, but we have. Oh, I know that because you can load them really hot and um, they don't back out. And the guy that was going to do that, he's on a six millimeter now, so that stuff's going to sit there for months. Uh, no, I'll shoot the six five when my barrel burns out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that'll be in a month, a couple months. You have to wait on that one. Let's see. Oh. Brian got some Defender ammo this week, actually. He sent me a personal thank you card with a shipment. Brian, did you use hey, did you use X-Ring in the coupon code? That'll save you some money. That'll save you money. Who is texting me right now? And then TB says, uh, opinion on the Vortex Viper PST. Uh, if it's the PST Gen 2, uh, and I'm not sure on the, the power of the 6 to 24, uh, that's a good scope. No issues with it tracking or anything like that. Um, I haven't used the EBR one MOA reticle, only the EBR two reticles and the uh, four and a half to twenty seven in the Razor HD. Yeah, I wouldn't have any reservations about Vortex. Lifetime warranty, no questions asked. That's right, and that's that's one of the reasons I went with that. Just just when you're spending that much money, uh, that's that's just a a. Uh, Little, little, you know, reassurance there to make make you feel better. Yeah, it's an adaptive. Pray for it is. My buddy Chris, Mister Elgato Grande, for some reason he can't comment on here. All right, I'm turning this on mute. Did you uh, did you lock him out at some point? No, I'd never lock. He used the code word X ray, no X ring. <laughs> X ring for 10% off, 100% off. <laughs> uh, Elster, you're supposed to be in bed sleeping. You didn't want to be yep. on the chat. That's right. The last text I saw from him. Yeah. 
So I, let me type an answer so he'll leave me alone. He'll leave me alone because I'm on a chat, Mr. Elgato. <laughs> so Eric brings up a good question. His question is, why are QD scope mounts so dang hard to find right now? I searched all day for a 30 millimeter mount. Uh, I've had about three people contact me today about uh, metal availability, steel and aluminum, because I, one guy's like, man, I'm having a hard time functioning steel right now. And another one contacted me about scope mounts. And another one contacted me about aluminum. And I was like, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen, I don't know what's going on, but <clears throat> I guess there was just a big run on the gun stuff. The only thing I can figure on those mounts. Hey, Tim, do you know why his account might not work? Show up. Can he, can he chat or can he submit chats in other, uh, other channels? Can you submit chats in other channels? You know what? I'm just going to do this. I don't know if it'll work or not, but. Hey, Rick, this question is for you. X-Ring, do you like SIG red dots? No. <laughs> he doesn't. That is the correct. <laughs> hey, you guys ask me a question that Ray would answer and i'll tell you i'll be i'll be pretty good i'll see how many points i can get and we'll let tim tim answer as well i'll go second and then we'll see what the answer is no, it's all good it's not about me but uh <laughs> no, i'm not a big fan of i hate to say this but i'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it i am not a fan of six hour optics at all uh dots scopes i've seen way too many fail uh i hope Hopefully no one from SIG is watching. If they are, take note because we see them going down out there constantly. I had a friend, not only the Tango, but the Whiskey Scopes, where the parallax knob fell off. This was brand new out of the box. He was sighting it in, firing it, and it fell off. I was like, you're kidding me, dude. So I'm assuming SIG is not in the business of making scopes and red dots, and they're probably private labeling somebody else's product. You know, I have no idea. I really don't. And it's funny because I gave Val a hard time uh, with bald and curious because he bought a red dot. And how long was it, Rick? Did it take, was it two weeks? Was it even two weeks? Oh, when is it Romeo three, I think, or whatever died. Yeah, it went out on them. And I think it took three or four months. I don't even know if it's been resolved yet. Uh, they still have not sent him a new one. I'm in settings. I don't see anything, but I, I'm in StreamYard settings. TV's trying to help me out, but I don't know how to work it. I can't do this right now. I might have to agree with you there, Armament Axes, but I don't know that for a fact. Uh, Todd, <coughs> uh, if you weren't on the chat before, um, I have used many U.S. optic scopes. It is not the same as it used to be. The B-series scopes. I, I think this might have actually came up with Tim Davis one last time. That company is no longer based out of California. They've been bought by Zero Delta, and they're based out of Hickory, North Carolina. Um, their Beast series are great. The other stuff, some of the stuff's coming from the Philippines. Um, just know what you're buying when it comes to the U.S. optics. Hey, Rick. Yeah. Real quick, if you're in the, uh, the YouTube uh, Super Chat, and up at the top, uh, you got the oh, three dots. Hold on, let me go to the let me go to that video. Hopefully it doesn't kill it here. Let's see. Um go okay, let me go to the chat. And then I gotta mute it real quick so it doesn't. So you want me to go like while I'm watching the video, right? Yeah, like yeah, in, in on the in the super chat on the right hand side at the very top there's three dots and there's like a list of things like participants okay hold on it's loading up i'm probably over taxing. i'm probably over taxing my thing but okay. that out bobby solar homestead i will say this without a doubt 100 and yes i have uh it would be an aim point <laughs> that is what i trust my life to <laughs> yeah bad billy knows that Okay, I'm there now, Tim. Do you see his uh, screen name in that list of participants? No, I see Armin and Axes, Bad Billy, Blue Healer, Bobby Solar, Bradley, Ryan, Carcane, Elster, Eric, Idaho. So, 
if no. if you right click on uh, one of those names, do, does it give you options, or if you click on any of them, like like for example, yeah. you made you made TB a moderator some months ago. Yeah, oh, it, TB has a new logo. I just noticed it. Probably in that same area where you made TB a moderator is probably the same area where you could probably block people from chatting and commenting and stuff. Yeah, like that. I, I never blocked them. I was well, I'm not saying he intentionally did. I'm, but I'm wondering if if something didn't happen. Uh, maybe. Let me see. Hide chat. Oh crap. Um, probably you probably went to go block Elfsters and actually. Oh, I would. I uh, took, you know what? I keep blocking Elfster and he just keeps showing up. Yeah. I don't know what the deal is. Show chat. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Aim points are ugly, uh, but the only one that I've known to fail was when they came out with the uh, what was it? The M5, the little tiny one that used a AAA battery instead of the double A's uh, for the M68 combat optic. Uh, they came out with this one. It was a smaller version. Uh, those had some troubles overseas. Um, when they first came out, I'm sure they fixed that. I do have a question. Somebody mentioned Burris quick release mounts. And I will say I used some of their older mounts for, for a while in competition. And what I noticed, and hopefully they've changed this. Maybe you guys can clarify, but the cam locks, or almost like a, a cast pot metal or something. They worked well. They never came loose, but that was something I never got really comfortable with. Uh, oh, I hope they address that, but I, unless they have, the ADM mounts are pretty solid. I've never had any issues with any of those. American Defense does do some really good stuff. Yeah. I have looked. You, can't, you, can, you can take someone and put them on a timeout, and you can make them a moderator, but there is no... Uh, you can't, you can't uh, get to anything where you can find somebody to add in because he was never erased. I have the same problem with uh, resisted tyranny so for some reason. It's weird. Um, just so you know, uh, Sharpie Jumper, <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, that guy from uh, England or wherever that the Batatika, he was actually on a chat last night. Uh, that was Italy, and oh, he said Italy. he's actually. Yeah. Yeah, he's actually going to – you're talking about Roberto? Yes. Yeah, he's actually going to do a, uh, a little video thing and send it to us uh, on how his results turn out. So uh, to yeah. fill these guys in if they hadn't heard. So uh, I do get a lot of emails. I'm sure you guys do as well. If you have a channel, a lot of guys will just email you with questions. And I always respond to all of them. But uh, his, he was torn between a Remington PCR and a Tika, but he lives in Italy. Well, the price of the Remington is actually about the same price as the Tika, which was very surprising to me. Uh, but he ended up going with the Tika because it was the same price, which I, ended, I think it was 2,100 euros. And uh, he should be happy with it. I've never seen anybody get a bad Tika. Probably paying import taxes on the yeah. uh, on the Remington. Yeah. yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. That was pretty crazy. That's pretty cool, though. He's actually in Japan. He was in Japan yesterday. Uh, I don't know why, maybe work or something. I was like, man, be safe over there. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy. It'd be pretty cool. I guess he's trying to get to your class, actually, if it's the same guy I'm thinking of. Ever, if we can ever get him back up and running. Like I said, I can't get the, the community center still closed down. I think the governor said they're not going to open up the state on the 1st of May. They're going to hold off till the 8th or the 9th. So, who knows? But, um I'm going to have to agree with Joaquin. I do believe the hollow suns are better than the six when it comes to red dots. Yeah, I've, I've seen a couple go down, but can happen well, with hollow, you, I guess. No, not hollow sun. Yeah, I haven't either. And uh, I know I was privy to a part of some testing that an agency was doing and they were going to consider those because they didn't have a big budget. And we ran those things through the, the those dots through the ringer, and we never had any. Hey, Rick, you uh, see me? Armament Naxes, it was the latest video that uh, Rick actually edited 
and I put on my channel. That yeah. Illinois well, June 1st. We talked about it in the beginning of the chat, actually. Um, they were thinking you could have made it all the time, but I'm like, no. <laughs> he was down to two two outs and two strikes. What's up, Otter? How are you doing? <laughs> no look with the jump. LOL. Yeah. yeah. Ray, I thought the way you uh you called your shot there on that very last one, you're you're actually just toying around in the beginning. Yeah, no, no. It was uh in the beginning, like I said, we were sitting around. We were eating. What were we eating? Pizza? I don't remember. No, we were eating Wendy's. Uh, and Wendy's. That's right. We were eating. That was yesterday. Good gracious. I'm getting short on my memory. But, um, yeah, we were just sitting there, and I had it in my pocket from work because I was marking up some tubes, and it popped up in the air, and my daughter looked at it, and she started laughing. I was oh, like a rabbit. And I was like, I wonder if the rabbit can go in the hole. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that was pretty cool. You you called that one perfect. Yeah. So how's that uh, Cerakoted barrel? How's the Cerakote job? Oh. Uh, holding up. Freaking awesome. Yeah. Uh, Rick saw it and he was like, dang, that looks better than like in the <laughs> – yeah, because he's the only one that's really seen it first person. And it is it is a perfect match. Now, ironically, believe it or not, Cerakote makes – AI flat dark earth, actually international flat dark earth. But of course, I'm, nobody's going to have that on hand. So it was close enough. You really can't tell. Well, it looked good from the video. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it worked out well. It actually matches perfect. We are lucky. Shy ball. Okay. I know well, I'm going to say that wrong. This is a good question. Hey, guys, I asked about suppressor piston coatings last time. All the uh, nickel bore or the coating facilities closed. If you were to choose from titanium nitride or DLC, what would you choose? You know, why are you wanting to coat the piston? Is it just to shed carbon, I would assume, or are you trying to get extra lubricity so you're not dragging on O-rings through the piston retainer? That would be my question. Um, I think they're both probably good choices, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like he wants to do the inside of it. Well, originally, he's talking about... There's, originally, when I read it, I was just thinking he wanted the outside done. Yeah, the outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just to change the color maybe or something. I don't know. Yeah, if you can find somebody that'll do a one-off piece. Yeah, that's going to be tough. Especially, will they have to have a FFL? I guess they, they no. could do it in an hour. huh? No, no, it's not a regulated part. Okay. Why AI are a very common rifle to the average consumer? Oh, well. Wow. Yeah, titanium nitride is very, very easy to clean. I mean, any of the coatings. Uh, you know, you get into the PVDs, the DLCs, or titanium nitride, any of that. I mean, the stuff just wipes off. Now, I heard this question, I think, from Brian once before, that KB coat stuff. I think he, he asked me when I polished up that bolt for the Ruger. I think I even asked you about it, remember? Yeah, no, I haven't. Um, I don't know. I've seen some independent testings. Of everything from you know gun coat, I think KB coat was in the test, Cerakote, and it really depends on what type. And because there's so many different, you got high temp Cerakote, they all have different properties to them. So I, I don't know. Um, I haven't messed with KB coat personally. No. Boom. Demolition Ranch Titanium intruded a cheap 1911 and it was much better afterwards. Okay. Yeah, uh, so Matt Billy's boron sucks. He will never buy another nickel boron bolt carrier group, uh, which is odd because it's supposed to shed carbon pretty easily. However, I have noticed that a lot of nickel boron, and somebody back me up or disagree or whatever, 
that nickel boron bolt carrier groups discolor very easily. Um, it's That's like they get fun. dirty, gray, hazy look. You just, you'll never get off. Yeah, I was a little, I think if you shoot a rifle a lot, like the bolt carrier group I have is on a three gun rifle. And I was saying, oh, it's going to be great. I'll just wipe it off and I'll throw it back in, put a little oil on it. You can do that and it cleans up, but it turns to a smoky, like blackish gray color. Yep, that's it. <laughs> yeah, uh, just the piston. I have the Omega and the Osprey. The pistons get caked and very difficult to clean. I've used tumblers, the stainless media, and sonic cleaners. Yeah, um, one, one of the best. You, you, uh, I can't say the coating. I just I can't say it. There's a coating that works really, really well, um, but it's proprietary to a certain company that owns the rights to it, and it sheds better than anything else. So between the ones you said, I'd probably, I'd probably say just go with the titanium nitride. Just use. This is the magic stuff right here, guys. Where's it at? I'm going to show you a little secret. Flex. I'm going to show you a little secret. I guess I'm not. It's all gone. I was going to show you a can of uh, Krylon rattle can stuff. <laughs> rattle can fixes everything. You got a scratch on your gun? No more. Say no more. Poof. Dude, you could use that rattle can for everything. You can put it on your car. You could put it on your outdoor patio furniture. That is right. There is no limits. Say the drapes in your house go down. Say it's too sunny outside. You want to fix that? Rattle can. Absolutely. Fix that. <laughs> rattle can, instant blackout curtains. Say you're tired of the sun going through your window along the thing while you're driving. Rattle can, fix that. Okay. <laughs> Sun in your eyes while you're driving down the highway. <laughs> Little rattle can on the outside. You're good to go. Shazam. Shazam. That's right. And if you act right now. All right. Enough of that madness. Let's see. KB is going, doing a huge BCG comparison. Oh, he is. I saw that video. Yes. Uh, I'm actually, I, we've talked quite a bit about that video at length. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of bolt carrier groups from some of these big name companies all come from the same place. It's kind of like the forges on the ARs. Um, and there's many that are there that no one would even know who made those. But they all, not they all, but a lot of them come from the same place. Yeah, same machine. Th there was actually one comparison that he left all this out of the channel, I believe. I don't, I don't remember. The exact same bolt carrier group. One is three hundred. One is one hundred and twenty dollars. It depends <laughs> on who you buy it from. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's how the world works. Yeah. Hey, Rick. Uh, Carcane uh, mentioned you could throw in a little flex seal too with the uh, rattle can. Oh, for sure. That stuff's magic. I actually want to do a video on some AR five hundred plates. Basically, they don't have any spalling protection on them and do a kind of a thing between uh, that flex seal and then that spray and see what kind of uh, fragmentation we can get off of it. But I haven't done that yet. It's just on the list of things in my head. Well, you get lower, the range says. So I go to work today. Hey, Doug. And Corey. Uh, you guys don't know Corey, or some of you might. <clears throat> he is kind of like, uh, what's the word for it? Um, he does a lot, of this, a lot of social media stuff for Microtech, for the knives. But he's always coming in with different plate carriers, chest rigs, all this. He was never in the military, never police, anything like that. But he's always got this high-speed gear. So he comes in there today, and he's got this, as uh, some some new plate rig that a bunch of SF guys are running. It uses magnets. See, so there's no Velcro or anything and you can't physically pull these magnets apart. It's not going to happen. You got to hit a little release tab for it to release. And so he's sitting there and you know, if, if you've ever used plate carriers or, or anything like that, they have grab handles on the back. 
And when you drag somebody, it's a pain in the butt because, I mean, typically there's a lot of adrenaline running. And if you grab them, you're going to pull them without any issue. But what they've done is they've devised this system where it has a handle. And when you pull it, it extends out about two feet. That gives you the extra leverage to get their upper body up. And it's not so taxing on you. And he was, he told me it took him an hour to pack it properly. <laughs> so, pull it out pull it, it, Jason. so, so he's walking around the office and he's sitting at his desk with this plate carrier on, right? Well, you know me, I can't stand it. So I jerked the thing and I've never seen Corey get angry at anyone in my <laughs> life. I mean, come on, we spent three days with him, right? <laughs> I saw yeah. his face get red. I mean, it just the temper, I could just see it. I was like, dude, I didn't mean to tick you off. I said, I'll repack it for you. He's like, you see my knuckles? You see my knuckles? And you could see his hands were just all tore up. And I was like, why are you so upset, dude? It's just, it's just, uh, it's just a grab handle. And he said, man, it took so long for me to pack that in there. My hand was just raking on the back of that Velcro. I said, they not give you the plastic spoon. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, give me your clipboard. I packed it in about a minute and a half. He was like, son of a <laughs> Of course, everybody in the office is dying laughing. I was like, yeah, right tool for the job, dude. <laughs> but, uh, he was. I said, see, you got angry, but you learned something. It was a learning experience. Yeah. And if you guys have ever messed with any of that deep Velcro in a tight area, that's how you do it. Get something plastic mm. like a shim, and you can just slide it in there perfectly. Tongue, tongue, uh, tongue depressor. The, the big tongue yeah, yeah well, that's if it's narrow, but if you can get it like a plastic clipboard that's somewhat flexible, man, it is awesome. <laughs> hey, Kenny. Sounds like a cool rig minus the hours of packing, yeah. Oh, man, he was he was so upset. Oh, uh, Raptor, uh, that was the first name of it. It was like Raptor Works or Raptor something. It wasn't cheap, that's for dang sure. Did it seem pretty cool? Yeah, it did actually. It was uh, it was pretty nice. I'm I'm just wondering kind of a hostile work environment that you're in if people feel like they have to wear plate carriers to work. Uh well, what you have to understand is uh Microtech is very pro gun, okay? Mm -hmm. Very pro gun. So, um you know, there was actually a thread that popped up like two years ago about, no, they're anti-gun. Bull crap. <laughs> it's like no. It's like half the guys are packing um and it's fine. Dude. Because the owners are pro gun, uh, you know they used to make rifles, uh, so no, it, it's fine. It's it's cool around there actually. Hmm. Rick knows he's been he's been there. I uh, have. Yeah. yeah, there's cool stuff laying everywhere. Don't know how many of you use SB at pistol braces, but I I bought a strap from mine called the Split Fix. Fixes a split in the bottom of the brace will. The brace was the biggest pain in the ass ever to install. Well, Billy, you know what? I'm going to sleep better tonight knowing that you got that installed, buddy. Hmm. Gave Bad Billy a, a wrench, too. I was feeling froggy while I was messing around trying to figure out Chris's thing. Well, got to a grande. What else going on? Anything new and exciting there, Tim? Did you figure out a way to get me on the back screen, blue screen thing? Uh, yeah, playing around with that that software. Uh, yeah, so I could uh, I could bring it in. So like where I'm in the corner of the picture, and then like I had your video chat up in the back, like you know, like on the <laughs> like the news, you know, like the news where the yeah where that's the cool. sitting on one corner and they got the video playing from the the <laughs> you know the car accident scene or whatever. Yeah, I saw your but, email. I think I replied to it this morning, like at two thirty or something, because I couldn't yeah. sleep. Yeah, speaking of which, I um uh, I it, it turned on my I, I usually watch YouTube videos. Uh oh well not I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. I got rid of cable. And so like I, I'll watch uh the five that I uh, on Fox, but I'll watch it off of YouTube. And um so I just have it play the one video and it stops. So I woke up at some point and I go to turn the TV off and and uh it had gone back to like here's the videos that are going on right now and your live chat at one o'clock or so in the morning was up <laughs> that, guy, that guy doesn't quit i know i'm like what the hell am i doing up so late 
everybody was asking me, what are you doing up? You should be in bed. And I'm like, it's it's only 12 o'clock. Like everybody else is up. Yeah. Every once in a while, I, I, I stay up late, but every once in a while, I, I, cause I'm still working. So, you know, I'm somewhere between eight and nine o'clock. I, I sit down and actually start working in the morning. So every once in a while, staying up late catches up with me and I, I got to get to bed early. I hear you. Yeah. I've been staying up late and waking up late. So it's kind of on a cycle. I'm on like a swing, sh swing shift or something. <laughs> Although I, I did get the uh, the word today that I'll most likely will not be going back to the office for the rest of the year. Wow. Yeah. And uh, they're they're trying to figure out how they're going to what what it's going to look like with our because the, they just remodeled our offices and we we have um, that open floor plan but trying to figure out how you're going to put people in there and give enough space for everybody so there's probably going to be a lot of people that aren't going to work every day in the office or maybe just not come in at all if they don't have to be there um and then my wife she got uh she got word today that uh i think it's probably gonna be august before she goes back into the office and works it'll be months you said august some sometime in august oh, yeah. okay yeah. Uh, John, I um, congratulations on your new purchase. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, I, I do him, make so. sure to call us whenever he gets his optic and it all set up. We'll take him out for it. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, well, I I painted it myself. Actually, uh, Ray was there. Sam was there, and we did it right right here. Matter of fact. Yeah, I feel like I feel like Ray and Sam were behind you cringing the entire way. They were. They were. I was. I was. Yeah. I was. yeah. <laughs> They're like the rifle. I only owned like it eight hours, old. ten hours or something. Yeah, it was like a day old, and he was like getting all the spray cows. Like you're gonna paint that thing? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I was probably going to paint my other one actually. I just I went out and I bought my gun in the color that I I like so. Which is what black? Uh, no, well, actually, the chassis is kind of a uh, not not quite a haze gray, but but somewhere in the in the gray family. That's cool. So, and the um, the barrel is is kind of a dull chrome type. Nice. Color. Yeah, I I enjoyed it. it. Actually, turned out decent. I like it. Yeah, Ray. I I've been trying to get Ray to you know. Rattle can is AI, but he ain't going to do it. No, no. I, I do it the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Krylon's cool, though, man. You go, you know what? I am in the... Uh, oh, Krylon mini guns. <laughs> I trust me. I know you, I've seen some of your old uh, bipods that still got some paint on them. Yeah, that, that's all work stuff. I don't have to mess with that anymore, so I don't Krylon anything. See, yeah, airbrush. I'd like to mess with that airbrush before. My wife is a teacher. They're done for the year. Yeah, my daughter actually asked if she thought we were she'd have to go back to school. And my wife's like, I don't think you're gonna have to go back this year. Doesn't sound like it. Yeah, our, our kids are out for the rest of the year here in Indiana. I mean, they're, they're still attending at home, you know, classes and stuff. But, um, and I've I've heard that, uh, like Indiana University, Purdue, those guys are talking talking about uh, not holding uh, classes on on campus next fall either. Really? Yeah. Man, just continuing to do the remote. But I mean, how is this country going to survive, Tim? I mean, this thing's not going to go away. It, no, it's it, not. It's not going to go away. I mean, how no. how long? I mean, I know we have to look out for everyone's welfare, but at the same time, I mean, we're not going to be able to make it as a society. I mean, businesses are just going to die. You know, you're absolutely right. And and Rick and I were kind of talking about this earlier. There's, you know, there's a. I, I think unfortunately we're we're falling victim to to some some political stuff. 
I um, believe so. There's a there's a group of people out there that I think want to see the economy fail so they can have a change in leadership. And uh, I I am really just dis- I'm severely disappointed in that because I don't think that helps anybody. And the and the ones that can afford to to live and and do that, well, they have twenty four thousand dollar freezers and you know thirteen dollar pints of ice cream in their refrigerator. But yeah. um, but I think everybody else, you know, they, they they really can't tolerate that. And uh, you know, I'm my wife and I are fortunate. We're both we're both still working, but. Um, you know, the, the, the people around us, I, I live in a, the town I live in, isn't like a, a wealthy town or anything. It's a lot of, of blue collar workers. And there's a lot of people that are, you know, trying to figure out where they're, uh, you know, where they're going to get food, you know, uh, the next week, you know, and be able to, to afford it while they're waiting for the mass influx of, of, of people that are filing for unemployment. You I know, know, and, and I the, the system not being in, in, in a position to handle, you know, that many people. I think we're, we're up to like 24, 26 million unemployed people now on, on, uh, that have filed for unemployment. And that's, that's not sustainable in any, any way, shape or form, uh, for, for a long period of time. And, you know, um, a lot of people, I mean, we have a, we have a fiat currency system here and, and that, and the value of our money is, is based on, on the good faith of, and, and, uh, and our economy. And as, as long as it keeps going in the tank, the value of money is going to go down. They can keep printing it, but you know, yeah. at some point we'll be like Mexico where you can be a millionaire and have <laughs> yeah. you know, 10, 10 million pesos in your hand and, and uh, you know, buy a loaf of bread. Yeah. I think this fall is going to be either. I think this fall is going to be tough for the reasons of food. So you got, all the farmers, right? And everything goes in a cycle. So depending on what month or season it is, is when they planted something. And we basically lost this, this season of plants. They basically cropped them over because they didn't have anybody to get them to the stores or to bring them or pick them or any of that stuff. Now when fall comes, they may not even have any employees to plant all the stuff. So when it comes to fresh vegetables, fruits and all that kind of stuff we may be this is you i think we're going to see it more in the next couple months than we have now like right now you can go to the grocery store and pretty much get at least in our area anything you want yeah the yeah joaquin says uh he said i think the norm is going to be uh the mask are going to be a requirement as a way of life you know it's funny because you know a lot of times we try to I don't know, naysay or deny certain things. I had a really good friend that lived in Nagoya, Japan. And this was years and years ago. He goes, man, he goes, you wouldn't believe how many people just walk around with their phones, looking at their phones. I'm like, yeah, okay, that'll never happen over here. Well, that's what it is like here. But back then they were wearing masks. And Rick, you can confirm this. You, you guys, anybody that goes to any casinos, go to Vegas, who are you going to see wearing a mask? And this was five, 10 years ago. It's all the Asians. They're wearing masks. Um, and I'm not trying to make this a racist thing, but it is a fact. Okay. You go to any casino five years ago, you're going to see masks and it's going to be an Asian person wearing it. Yeah. I, I don't doubt that that would probably be something as a norm in the future. I'm not wearing a mask. I'm not doing it. Now, I can't say that. Um, when I go into work, I have to wear a mask. It's not a requirement, but if you go into a room and there's a few people in there and everyone has a mask, you almost feel like, you know, I really want to dirty their space up or have them looking at me funny. So, yeah, I'll throw on a mask. Yeah, Um, Yeah, I just understand what you're saying. It's just if we come to that, this is just horseshit. So the the, the problem with the masks and and, um, the, the surgical masks that people are wearing. Um, doesn't protect me. If I'm wearing one, it doesn't protect me. No, no, it's to keep you from coughing and expelling. That's ex- exactly, exactly. So, uh, you know, if I'm not coughing, I don't necessarily see a need to, to wear a mask to, to wear a surgical type or put a, you know, a, a bandana or something over my face. 
Now, an N95 mask is going to protect you from what you breathe in, but it doesn't protect anybody around you on what you breathe out because the way that rubber diaphragm is, you know, it it uh, it sucks clothes and, and makes you breathe through the filter. But when you exhale, the diaphragm spell. opens up. and yeah. lets you, Exactly. So anything that you may cough, you know, you've just now pushed out through that that hole. Yeah. And the, the diaphragm. So, it, you know, you almost have to wear both or a respirator, a respirator. or a gas yeah, mask exactly. <laughs> or a gas mask or something that's, you yeah. know, got a filter on it where you're, you know, both your in, inhaling and exhaling come, uh, come, come through the filter. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think it is. And, you know, the, the week before all this kind of broke out, I was out there in San Francisco and, um, you're talking about the mask. When I was walking to the airport, I'm looking to see, you know, who had masks on, you know, and, and not really, not too many people did have masks on other than the people that probably would have just worn them anyways. Okay. So you're wearing a mask and all of a sudden, and you're doing good. And now you, you come in contact with these people, right? Mm. But now, now you take the mask off. You know, as you get in your car, you take the mask off. Now you're touching the mask, and then you're like, oh, man, my freaking eye itches. Now you're scratching it. I mean, you're almost bringing that stuff, If especially if you don't have masks. Oh, I got to bring put Ray back in here. You're uh, at some point, you're basically cross-contaminating and making it worse, per se, unless you have a cycle of masks you can go through where you're, you're going to ditch them and get rid of them and and move on to a new one. It's the same thing with the, the latex gloves or the, you know, the, you wear those into the grocery store, but then you have to stick your hand in your pocket to grab your wallet to, to pay. And um, then all of a sudden now you got whatever Wuhan flu that was on your hands and on those gloves now all over your wallet. I, I, I don't know. I, I think at, at some point we're just going to have to bite the bullet and, um, Get the herd immunity. Is that what I think what they call it? The herd. Yeah. I hope you don't Hello, John. What's up, John? Both of you. John, we John. talking about you, KB32, and your bull Did, carrier group. Yeah, hey, check Did, your uh, check your guys' emails, KB and WTF. KB says he's going to bed. See you, buddy. Have a good night. Did you guys see uh, Governor uh, Governor Cuomo's press conference today? Did not. No, I think the guy's a douchebag, so I don't watch his stuff. I'm I'm not a big fan of him either, but I I just happened to catch it uh, a, a a segment of it. Um, so uh, I guess New York they tested about three thousand people across the state, people that that were out running around at like grocery stores, big box stores, stuff like that, eighteen and above. Um, and they're now estimating based on those results that they have about. 20 i think i think it was a 20 percent of their population um has tested positive for the antibodies for for corona which uh he said you know obviously elevates the number of people based on the confirmed cases then um but then uh he was talking about like right now he said they're only counting deaths of um people who have died in the hospital or in a nursing home that have been confirmed, but he said that now they're going back. We're going to try to have to figure out how to, to go back and look at some of the other deaths. Um, and I think he had mentioned something about California and they, they had, are now starting to think that November, December um, they've had people back as far back as November, December in California were possibly infected and trying to figure out now if, if maybe some of those deaths were related to COVID. So, well, they're going to put them as, as they are for sure. Yeah. Well, and that's the one, that's the other thing that I, I'm, I, I'm a little frustrated with too, is that, you know, they're so here in, in Indiana, you know, in Indianapolis, it's a big city. They're, they're testing, but you don't necessarily know what happens in, in some of the counties. They may not test them. They just might assume or, you know, presumptively diagnose them with, covid uh oh. based on symptoms and then the other thing they're doing is they're recording deaths um based on that but 
you know, wh whether they they've had or you either confirmed or presumed to have it, but was it necessarily COVID that contributed to their death? Did they have a heart attack? You know, would they have had this condition, you know, or, or cause of death if it was something other than, you know, something other than the COVID that are all being related or tied back to the COVID, which elevates a death rate. But I don't know if it's accurate. Yeah. I don't know if you can say the C word on here anymore. YouTube. I think TV had said something in there. You can say the C word now. <laughs> you can now. Okay. Yeah, they've, they've now that it's now that it's mainstream. Oh, now that it's okay. <laughs> yeah. They, they, I saw something about that the other day too. Okay. This is a big problem right here. This is a, something that is going to impact everyone around the country. So freight has fallen flat. Hundreds of empty trucks in Dallas looking for loads. And 7 p.m. all the truck stops in Amarillo, Texas was still 60% empty. Things are going to be bad. I have to agree with Idaho Rogers. I think someone on here drives trucks, and I don't know if it's him or not, but um, – I believe it might be. I know someone that watches this channel that's always commenting as a truck driver. So if that's him, he would definitely know. Um, and and as far as the uh, SoCal had said, you can't get it in your eyes. But right in here is some of your duck stuff. And I believe, you know, when you wear your mask, you try to keep it out of your mouth, the nose and here. But. Yeah, along your eyes as well, you can actually transmit it, I believe. I don't know. I could be wrong. Okay, so let's address this question before it gets too far away from us. Uh, Otter was asking about the reticles, and he was asking about an open center or a dot. Um, I prefer an open center with a dot, not just an open center. Uh, I have used closed reticles. I've used open centers. I've used open centers with a dot. Just make sure that that dot in the center is small. So he said, and why? And that is so you can still be precise with it, but you can still see everything around that dot. That is the one cool thing about your scope over mine. Mine is a cross. Yep. It does have, I wish I had it here. I got to say really do, but I can't bring it out. The, um, but I, I noticed that that little fine tiny dot is really cool for stuff when you're trying to really be precise or make a good group or and a lot of reticles the line's too fat if you're trying to shoot something precise anyway so depending on what you're trying to do with it but I've noticed that some reticles that I've shot in the past are too fat for really making a good hit or a good group I should say because it's covering up too much. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie. I only own one scope and uh, it's got the trimmer three reticle in there as, oh, oh. as recommended, as recommended by the X ring. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a nice scope for sure. It is a busy reticle, but if you're going to get into long range and, and even SoCal's on here and he runs the trimmer three as well, he is a hundred percent satisfied with it. Is it necessary for everyone? No, it's not, but, you've got everything there that that reticle does a whole lot matter of fact rick and i went over it last night we probably spent about an hour going through what all you can do with that reticle only have your exact mills or if you have you know you know a half a mill for your wind holds but it also has wind dots now you have to Use a Kestrel or determine what your wind dots mean as far as miles per hour. And you really can't do that without the ballistic coefficient, the ammunition you're shooting to tell you what it is. If you're shooting a 6.5, I can tell you it's going to be about four miles an hour per dot. It's going to be somewhere in there. It's close enough. Uh, but you also have uh, mover gauges. You have sizing ranges uh, gauges. And you have the 10th mils at the top and at the bottom horizontal on the left and right. So it's, it's actually really cool once Rick got to studying it. And two tenths down where mine are every half, which when you got to shoot at 2.3, you're pretty screwed because you're you're guessing in between those two lines. But Ray's yeah. is two, four, six, eight. It was nice. Yeah, once you know how to use it, it all melts away until you need it. That's yeah. Exactly. yeah. And uh, well, WTF said the best thing, it's not busy, it's information packed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> information that he agrees he prefers an open center with a dot and i will tell you tell you you know kenneth does a 
shooting as well. And, you know, these are the preferences that we kind of prefer. Yeah. I, think, I uh, agree. And I could be wrong. You guys might be up more up to date on this. I think the Trimmer 3 Night 4 7 to 35 is the new Marine Corps optic. Isn't that what the U.S. Marine Corps chose for their sniper systems? It's on an AI chassis, but it's based off of a Remington 700 Action with a Bartland barrel, I believe. I think that's supposed to be the new Marine Corps. Chambered in 6.5 is supposed to be the new Marine Corps setup. And that four miles per hour dot, that was for the 6.5, right? Bradley's asking. Well, First, yeah, but remember, jump. you need to calibrate it exactly for your muzzle velocity and everything. So I'm just telling you, if you have no clue or any idea what the dot represents, just pretend it's four and then the one beside of it's going to be eight and so forth, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, it's around four miles an hour and six, five pre more. Um, John's figured it out as well. Cause we had conversation as soon as he got his and we compared notes and his was around there as well. And he shoots them pretty hot. What's Eagle Eye talking about gun porn? <laughs> Uh, Kathleen had said she didn't know what we were talking about when we were talking oh. about the stuff. Like that. <clears throat> and then yeah. SoCal said, hiding it just dropped the trimmer four, which is just as good, but less busy. Uh, you know, I can see that, um, cause it is very busy. It's a busy reticle. You got a, you got a question for you on here, guys. So for, uh... Oh yeah. I, I, I have not started reloading yet, so um, right along with with long range precision precision rifle shooting, uh, I'm going to be journeying down to uh, reloading too. Okay, so I know Rick has played around with this actually. Don't you have a lead collet die? With the bushing? No, not? yeah, no, because well, I don't know. I have the same one you do because I talked into getting it, but. It's a call it neck sizer, but it has. So I guess the question, the answer would be yes. And I only, I only neck size. Okay. So, so my experience with that has not been with the Lee, but there's bushings when you're neck sizing and you can, I mean, there are tons of different bushings. Depending on the neck tension, you wonder how much you're on. Uh, I have used that. Has, but I haven't been reloading those here lately. Now, Rick's getting excellent results with his just using that. Actually, I am. What's up, John? What's up, Nick Knox? Truth Freeze and Kathleen Music Lover. And I thought I saw Vanessa out here somewhere. I believe I did. Howdy, howdy. Thanks for showing up. There are quite a few people watching, so that's cool. There was a question earlier. I don't know if you got. Oh, here's here's uh, Eagle Eye's answer. Well, that's cool. What's up, Levi? There was a question up here, though. Let me see if I can find it. Super Sharpie. Yeah, boot, blue heel. John's calling you the Super Sharpie Jumper. Yeah. That had his award ceremony. Have you had your award ceremony yet? No, no. Oh, this question by Otter. Did you guys answer that one? I might have been doing something no. else. The theoretical available here is an older version of a Vortex Viper PST Gen 2. As long as it's Gen 2 and not Gen 1. Uh, 5 to 25 by 50, first focal. MOA. Now you're in Europe. I'm, well, you know, I would think he would be in Mills, but uh, MOA, which is the only scope available in the country, which will get my old 308 out to 1,000 meters. meters. Well, it could be a combination of how much can't you have in the in your setup too, because you can you can always dial it out a lot further if you get enough can't in the mount. Yeah, buy a different mount with. 20 MOA or something. Or more. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, if he's talking about his old 308, it's probably going to be a bolt gun. So the best he's going to be able to do, depending on what it is, is probably buy a 20 MOA base. And so that'd probably be about it. 
they, there are some companies that make some adjustable cant rings, but I'm not a big fan of those. I haven't seen a system that really kind of jives. I know Barrett used to actually make some as well. He said, yeah, the mill scope was sold last week. That's what I thought. And then Daniel says, don't can't. No, no, not, <laughs> not this kind of can't. Oh, hold on. Not this can't, but we're talking about this can't. Tipping the uh, objective of the scope downwards to give you more elevation travel. <laughs> he's, just, he's probably just being silly anyways. Yeah, uh, Otter, I understand, you know, M, a mil, MOA, just numbers. I mean, I'm very familiar with that. Like I said, I teach a lot of that, and I understand that it's just numbers. However, if you do a lot of long-range shooting, and you can ask Rick his personal experience, I'll let him go into this because I'm very proficient with both, but my preference is mills, and here's the reason why. Up to you, Johnny. <laughs> this is a long story, man. Well, don't make it that long, okay? <laughs> All right, so I've been training every scope I ever owned before hanging out with X-Ring was MOA stuff. And never even really needed to know anything about it. They weren't turret-style scopes. And uh, I wasn't shooting long distances with it. It was more like 22 screwing around plinking. Um, then there was a scope that became available, and I got it for a really good price. I picked it up, and it was mill. And I wanted mill anyways because Ray shoots mill. Everything he talks about is in mill when it comes to looking through a basically a spotting scope and all that kind of stuff. So I really train myself to do mills. Now I train myself to do mills so much that when I'm looking at a tape measure, I'm basically counting like every line. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing quarter halves and all that bullshit. True <laughs> story. <laughs> we're making fun of me. So we're cutting uh, siding and I'm like, okay, that's a. Uh, eight tenths basically and uh ray's just looking at me like you're an idiot and i'm going yeah i'm an idiot but i didn't want to change my whole pro thought process so i've really come to like mills as well okay so a lot of people overthink it they really do okay a lot of people say oh, it's just it's so easy man i'm just thinking you know quarter you know one click is a quarter MOA, which is going to be, you know, just think about, you know, 25 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents a dollar. And if you say, well, one click at, uh, at a hundred yards is a quarter of an inch, then at 400 yards, it's one inch. It's just easy. It makes sense. And I don't want to think in 0.36 or thirds. You don't have to. How many times have you ever had to figure that out? No. Like, ever on the range. No. It doesn't matter because what you're going to do is you're going to establish your dope for given target distance. Now, if I ask Rick right now at 500 yards, what's your dope in mills? 3.6. Okay. It's just a number, just like Otter said. Now you can convert that over pretty easily to MOA, but the thing is, is most of your spotting scopes are going to have mill reticles. It doesn't matter if it's a loophole or whatever. And yes, you can get MOA reticles, but your majority, I'm talking 90 plus percent of people that show up at a range with a spotting scope, if it has a reticle in it, it will be a mill reticle. So because of that, if Rick takes a shot at 3.2 mils and I've got the spotting scope on it, I'm looking through that reticle in the spotting scope because you'll learn it's a whole lot easier and better to train and shoot long range with someone spotting. It's It'll make your day much more enjoyable and you won't go through a ton of ammo because you're going to make your hits. That's why sniper teams are usually two-man teams, sniper, spotter. So if he hits, I'm not going to say, oh, you're high. Well, how much high am I? He's going to say, stupid, how much high am I? And I'm going to look. I'm gonna Just say, a little high. You're two-tenths high. You need to come down to three. If he's in my way, and let's say his hold is five and a half minutes of angle, I want to be looking through that spot and scope. I want to say, uh, you're high, come down a couple inches. I, I'm not going to be able to give him an exact measurement because we're not talking the same language. It's like, Tim, you need to do 128 kilometers per hour. Quick, how many miles per hour is that? Uh, you can't do it. Uh, I got to get hey, a calculator. <laughs> See, that's it's what I'm talking here. about. Don't it's overthink it. Up. And that's the thing that killed me when I was first shooting with Ray. I'd be looking through, I'd be looking through the, his, uh, <laughs> his, 
got my braids. And I'd be like, yeah, it's like three inches low. And he's like looking at me, he's like, you're such an idiot. <laughs> three but inches. That was, that, that was before I learned it. The radical. <laughs> well, no, I would see the bullet hit impact and it'd be like, I don't know, about three inches away. <laughs> but, but, um, uh, go ahead, Tim. Uh, well, I was going to say, I, I, uh, um, as uh, odor is that how you pronounce the name? Water, I yeah, there you go. Uh, I, I just saw that the MOA clicks are more precise than than Mills. I I would think okay, they're all. I, I need to address defined, that. Yeah, I mean, there is no one, including myself or Ken or anybody else. Uh, I'm going to speak for Ken. Hopefully, I'm not speaking out of turn. He'll back me or he won't. There is no one that I think that's doing long range shooting other than like, you know, bench rest shooters or whatever to where if you're shooting at a thousand yards, that difference between one click at a thousand and one click at a thousand in mills or, or, you know, let's say a 10th of a mill or the difference, I think it's 2.5 inches. No, it's uh Oh crap. I can't remember exactly, but it's like two inches. If you can hold that difference at 1000 yards, you are the freaking man. So the where those fine clicks are going to matter doesn't really matter, okay? Maybe at 100 yards, if you're trying to shoot a, a pencil-headed racer size target, and let's say you're a little left and you need to move to the right, well, it's going to move a quarter inch as opposed to 0.36 inches, roughly a third of an inch. It's not that big of a deal. <coughs> and that's why, send it. There you go. Bound it. That shot over. I'd like to hear what uh, just move what over. Eagle Eye says about my comment. Oh, uh, there you go, Bryson. Hey, you hey, 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 you hey, hey, it. See, Bryson's on here too. Uh, what's up, Bryson? With twenty-seven point seven seven, and everything else is easy. And that's just uh, to figure out distances. Yeah, see, Eagle Eye, he did back me up. Yep, it's negligent. Mills MOA adjustment is very similar. Conservative Sniper's got a question here. Okay, that is a great question. No, Dang, no. I wish I wasn't on here because, like I said, the guys that do it a lot, uh, we all think kind of the same way. I mean, you start thinking out of the box too much, you're, you're going to find yourself not doing well at it. Um, the thing is, is... The question is, what would X-Ring and Kenny pick for long-range shooting? Say there was no mill scopes in the market, MOA with quarter, half, three-quarter, or one inch. Okay, so most of your military-based scopes, your ACOGs, things like that, you might have a half mill or a half MOA or a one MOA, something like that. If I had a choice and I'm shooting long-range, I would prefer quarter-inch MOA adjustments, not eighth, Okay. I actually had a guy in my class, the last class, if he's watching, I apologize, brother, but uh, I'm going through everybody's gear, and I was like, you got an eighth-click adjustment scope. And he's like, yeah. I was like, dude, you're going to be doing a lot of clicking at 700 yards, okay? Just think, guys, he's got to click eight times for one minute of angle. And he was like, man, this is a top-end loophole. I paid $2,000-something. I said, like, dude, it's, it'll work. It'll get you by. I said, but that's really not the best if you're going to be dialing. And he didn't have a holdover reticle either. Within 15 minutes of us being on the course, his turret's completely locked up. The erector tube seized, and there was no way to get it released. It wouldn't do any windage. It wouldn't do any elevation. No matter how much you turned on the knobs, it locked up. That was one upset cat because he had just gotten that scope like a month before. And so <laughs> we had we had some rifles, and I was like, yeah. I said, this is really more of a more of a bench rest style sc scope where you're looking for those really, really precise adjustments. Not your best for long, long range. What's up, Kenny? Nobody <laughs> knows better. No, I like to have somebody to back me up. I mean, you know, it, it can't be just my opinion. It's people that do it. Yeah, no, everything you're saying is exactly right. At a thousand yards, mill or MOA, one click, you're really not going to notice it. You know, like you're saying, if you could hold that adjustment, now uh, E shooting and B shooting a thousand yards. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
Now, I think your ammo is going to take more effect than that. Right. Yeah, there's so much. Uh, there's so much to it. There, you start shooting past a thousand yards. I mean, I know that some ELR shooters prefer the MOA at extreme long range just because it is a little bit more uh, fine tuned and adjustment. But you're talking about over a mile, two mile shots, you know. Okay, okay so uh, <clears throat> Otter has another good comment. I can't pull these up, but uh, I'll put them on the screen. But he says, "True MOS or MOA." What you're talking about is what we call in the United States. Maybe it's called something different in Europe, but it's called SMOA. Okay, so truly. One MOA is not one inch, and I've covered this in some of my videos. It's actually 1.047, and that does add up over thousands of yards or even less than that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards. But once again, we get into that whole kind of negligent area where you're not going to be able to notice that difference. But, yeah, there is a difference between MOA and SMOA, one being one inch at 100 and the other one being 1.047. So are you saying we have a leap MOA in there? <laughs> yeah, there it is. It's like, <laughs> like a leap year, right? Just just add an extra every four years, you'd be good with MOA. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you On go. the fourth year, you got to dial two extra MOAs over because of the – That's it. <laughs> but only in February. And, and, and that's one of the things I, I try to convey in any of my long-range videos is it's a lot easier to do than people realize, but I think people really over – think it and overanalyze a lot of the stuff that they read or that's put out there. Um, mm -hmm. I know for a fact, Kenny will back me up on this. As long as you have consistent velocities out of your ammo and you're not getting a lot of, okay, so, you know, you're shooting ammo that's just all over the place. Yeah. It's going to be harder, of course, but if you're shooting decent hand loads or good quality ammunition, it's not that difficult once you get a dope chart established. Absolutely. And wind. Everybody, I'm worried about wind. I want. Don't worry about that right now. That'll come later. It'll come with experience. There are a ton of formulas out there. If you don't have that formula and you just want to keep it simple, put it in Strelock, put it in Kestrel to give you a rough idea. There's no one that is going to be able to 100% every single time at 1,500 meters be able to hit a three-inch steel circle with a 20-mile-an-hour <laughs> crosswind. It's a good guess, and the more you do it, the better you're going to be at guessing it. Yeah. Practice, well, practice, 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 practice. Yeah. Almost like playing golf and going for hole, hole for one or hole ones. Yeah, so. I mean, yeah, I mean, think about it as a kid. You don't have that muscle memory to throw that ball with precision to your friend. But the more you do it, the more the more experience you get at throwing that ball, the better you are at judging. So you'll have more of an estimated guess. Okay, but you got to remember. Wind is never going to be a full constant or very rarely. If it's five miles an hour here, chances are it's not going to be a five mile an hour half value wind from here all the way out to a thousand yards. There's a lot of other variables that you have to take in. You have to look at the mirage. And a lot of people, we're getting some good, well, I think it's good topics. So yep. a lot of people, oh, I see the mirage, it's moving left or right. Well, what you need to do is focus your parallax and don't just look at the target. You can actually focus at that 500-yard point, and you can see the Mirage doing different things than it's doing at 1,000 or even 100 yards. It's all telltale signs of what's going on, and you have to take all of that data, put it together, because it might say, well, I'll go a tenth left here, a tenth right there. Well, guess what? I'm back at zero. <laughs> yeah. It cancels. Yeah. Yeah. There's other effects, too, in your hand loads. Like, I've been testing out some ELDs. Um you know, yeah. I can get the SDs down to super low, but ELDs have that polymer tip, and it burns up a little bit and deforms in the air. So you also yeah. have SDs at the target. So even yeah. though you have really low numbers, you'll you may start seeing your water what I call the water line of impacts actually deviate, and that's actually due to the bullet at those at those distances. You'll start seeing them kind of deviate. And that's why yeah. some burners and some uh, fine tip uh, hollow points actually work a little better once in a while. Yeah, and I don't know if I ever posted this video, but I was showing, kind of showing Rick. Just because you have two different hand loads that shoot lights out at 100 yards, you need to print them on paper at 500 on the same day because the mm -hmm. difference can be huge. Isn't that right, Rick? Yeah, like the one – there was one group – This was, I, had, I loaded up some ammo in the 6 millimeter, and it was lights out. I was like, dude, that is good, but I got to test it. Did it at 500 yards, it looked like a shotgun pattern. And the other one was like this, 
And I was like, there you go. You don't know until you start putting some targets out there and really testing it at distance to find out what's going on with that bullet. 100 exactly. yards is a good starting point. And it's weird because when you think, oh, I printed a great group at 100, nobody – well, at least I didn't I think – that's going to take place down there, but what's really going on is it doesn't give it enough time to do whatever the heck it's going to do at 500 or so. Yeah. It was pretty cool to watch that. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of a lot of voodoo involved in hand loading, that's for sure. If, if I see something incorrect, uh, I always try to address it so it doesn't get in somebody's head. But so at 1,000 yards, one MOA – is 1,047 inches. No, absolutely not. One MOA at 1,000 yards is going to be 10 inches. Right, Kenny? <laughs> yes, sir. Right about that, yep. 10.47 inches. Yeah, That's now, standard. if you want to go into the SMOA, take 1.047, multiply that times 10, and you're going to come up with the number it's not going to be exactly 10 inches it's going to be a little bigger than 10 inches but only in leap years but only in leap years that's right only in leap years does that count yeah that's right yeah what else we got sierra match kings are great for accuracy and energy transfer fresh valor they're good boys. yeah the range, the range has got it right 10.47 inches that's exactly right 10 and a half inches Conservative Sniper Hunter says, I would have thought you might prefer a three-quarter or one-inch adjustment for long range because of less clicks to adjust. Now, it's funny you should you should ask that question or post that because I actually had some uh, Night Force scopes back in the day that were built for 50 cal BMG or 50 BMG Barretts. And in the military, all they want to do is get close. I mean, you're just trying to hit a main. You're not trying to hit in the head. There's no headshots. I mean, you just want to get one on target. And those were all MOA clicks, and you could adjust to forever. Um, I actually had to send one back to Night Force to have some uh, cleaning done on it, if you will. Nothing broke on it. And they were like, where did you get this scope? And I was like, what are you talking about? And they said, yeah, these were designed specifically for a certain platform, and they're one-minute clicks. That's crazy. Yep. And it had all the full Rare little bird. Had, so, I could, you broke up. It had what? It had the full range like a normal scope, so you had some serious elevation. Yes, you had some serious elevation. That's Man, exactly that's right. gotta be. I would have loved that scope, but it was old school. But it was old school. One MOA turrets, windage and elevation, and a mil dot reticle. That's what <laughs> we need on the military. That's what we need on the twenty-two for that uh, seven hundred thousand yeah. yard. <laughs> If you couldn't run Black Hill 77 556, what would you run? Oh, oh man, I tell you what, Otter is just killing us here. And these are great questions, Otter. I'm glad you're asking uh, because you're getting good, solid information. He said, So it really doesn't matter between mil versus MO8 a thousand. Guess I shouldn't worry about Coriolis. No. And in my class, that's the first thing I was like, Before you guys start worrying about Coriolis and spin drift and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Yes, it all matters, but don't worry about it right now, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, like, just show me you can hit the target at 700, then we'll talk right. about it. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just get your yeah, rifle. Was on and, yeah, yeah uh, you, know, you know, a guy was like, you're not going to sit there and tell me that you can't shoot west, exactly west, at 1,000 yards, and then re turn 180 degrees and shoot 1,000 yards east, and not notice a difference. And I'm like, technically, yeah, you could notice a difference. If you can hold it and you do all the math and the wind and everything is exactly right, yes, there is a difference depending on where you're at in the earth as far as geographically. There can be a difference. But you don't need to worry about it right now. <laughs> yeah, you're, we're, you're talking about a three-second flight time, four seconds if that, you know, per thousand. So, yeah. I don't now, if you're know talking shooting thing of the three mile and all that other stuff, yeah, you want to run those numbers. You got a right. question, Tim, from Orion Fixer. Yeah, I, I saw that. I, I put it there. Uh, probably single stage wow. press to start off with, um, and and uh, 
primarily for rifle. Um, up until the uh, prices jumped up, pistol ammunition was fairly cheap. Yeah. Yeah, true. I'm going to let Ken answer Fresh Fowler's question because I'm no, going just, to no, say just no. Typing. No, at a mile, I don't even count or I don't compensate for Coriolis. What I do on my dope chart is compensate for spin drift. Absolutely. The bullet, there you go. Yeah. Spin drift is what you want to look at because certain bullets and certain velocities, your spin drift is going to start taking effect at that distance. Coriolis is, okay. is, is ridiculous. Okay. No, I, don't, I don't believe that. So for those that are not long range shooters, let's go ahead and define what we're talking about. Spin drift. The easiest way, and I have a I have a little thing that I use in the classroom and I throw it at people. It's basically like a little football and it spins. Well, if you think about throwing a football, and we're talking about not the wobble where you, you didn't get it perfectly, okay? We're talking about you threw it perfectly. If that thing is rotating left to right or right to left, depending on if you're a left-handed person, you are imparting a spin, and believe it or not, that football will actually – and a bullet will start basically cavitating towards that direction. I don't know if cavitating is the right word, but it will start spinning to the right or moving to the right if it has a left to right twist in your barrel. But that doesn't really come into play, and it really depends on the bullet and the velocity and everything else, like Ken said, but you're really not going to see numbers that you have to correct for uh, 600-ish. You might see a tenth depending on what caliber. I don't know. what What's a good number, Ken? Throw it out there. Um, I would say around like 600, yeah. you know, 700. Yeah. Yeah, and you might see a tenth, and you might see two tenths. Right. Yeah, I mean, be concerned with it and know about it and know what's going on, but that's what spin drift is, okay? Coriolis is basically – with the earth spinning and where we're at located based on the equator, depending if you're shooting west, east, north, south, as the earth is rotating, that bullet's in flight. The earth is moving underneath it, if you will, and that can impact where that bullet lands because now that bullet's in flight. Think about it. But the earth is spinning. It has now changed locations. So it's got to be in the air a long time. Okay, it really does. Yeah. Or the direction you're shooting in. Yep. There All right. Bryson wants to know about the if you couldn't run the seventy-seven grain five five six, what would you run? Black Hills. Um, is this like ammunition you get to buy, or when you make? Because I don't, I don't really run any factory ammunition. It was for Ray because he knows he shoots Black Hills seventy-seven right. grain. I was actually sorry I wasn't paying attention because I can't watch you guys and read the comments. And Fresh Fowler, I wasn't calling you out on that. He was just saying it wasn't a question. He was just saying at a mile, that's when he worries about it. Um, but like I said, that wasn't directed towards you, Fresh Fowler. We were just trying to clear it up for some people that aren't into long range so they know what we're talking about. Uh, it's easy for us to just to throw out spin drifts. Somebody's like, what are they talking about? Uh, you know, spinning a top or something like that. Now, conservative sniper says, how much spin drift are you getting at 1,000 with a 308? It depends. Kenny's the 308 king on this. He is. Uh, but typically, you're going to see two to three tenths, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all depends on the velocity, also in the bullet you're using. So, um, I noticed lighter bulls like the 168s tend to uh, have a little more spin drift compared to the heavy grains. Uh, sorry, I was, I was saying to look at that. There's a YouTube channel out there that I watch called Mark and Sam After Work, and he gets into the extreme long range using typical short action cartridges, long action cartridges. And he's putting these things out to 2,600, 3,000 yards on a, on a 6.5 Creedmoor. It's insane. So, yeah. Um, and he's got impeccable data of what he does, and nothing, uh, nothing he, he compensates for. It includes Coriolis. He even talks about it on a couple of videos. Yeah. So how, how do you measure spin drift over distance? I have, I have an idea in my head. I'm not sure if it's practical. Yeah. It's I know all the ability. A tenth in. A tenth to two tenths, depending on the wind. Yeah. I always, I always have to add it after six on my rifle. Right. You, it's just repeatability. You go out there different times of the day, um, different times of the year, 
check at your notes and see does it correlate? Is there a pattern? And that's where I go off of. So, like for instance, I got one e or one sixty eight grain ELDs. I got to dial in one point two five. Um, I'm mean, I'm in MOA in that scope or one mil, and I'm always on target at a thousand yards, as long as there's no wind. So it's just repeatability you really go off of. Wait, wait, you're dialing a mil of spin drift or Sorry, a mil? Um, point, point five. Yeah, I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> I've been using um. I just got into uh, I just got into mill, so I'm learning. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah, because that's that's a lot of spin drift yeah, at a thousand on. yards, Ken. Hold on. <laughs> uh, let me. Yeah, it's actually on this. Aren't you all CPU nerds? I don't know who he's talking about. No, I'm not a CPU nerd at all. Tim, uh, maybe I just jumped in. Or... Not me. I can barely get this thing to turn on half the time. I wish Korea had some flat earth. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Nick was gonna shoot. That's funny. Have a good one, our boy. Be well, my friend. Left a like. Appreciate that. Yeah, if you guys haven't hit the thumbs up, definitely appreciate that. <laughs> Algato Jr. is going to have to upgrade his Red Rider. Yeah, I don't Elgato don't have any long range rifles. He's got some nice pistols. Right. Yep. 0.3 mils. That's what my my notes that, say. I think that's what I said, wasn't <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Well, that's a shit ton. I know. You know I'm just learning mills and I'm obviously uh, I didn't mean any disrespect, but I cut my teeth on a once on a on 308, it was, I swore I would never leave that caliber. And it wasn't until I saw the light in 2015 that I actually switched to 6.5 Creedmoor. And yep. it took a lot of convincing, but I'm glad I did. And I know you still play around with 308. I actually sold every last 308 that I owned. Uh, I love the cartridge. I love the availability of it. But um, yeah, I've shot a ton of 118 LR, uh, 170, you know, 175, 168 gold medal. Man. pallets of that stuff and i just enjoy the 6.5 better now for whatever reason yeah I, I built one just specifically for ftr um so i could stay in that class and also teach my student so gotcha gotcha what's okay. an easy way to answer this where you could give the information as more of a thing instead of just saying how many is that like if you start from the beginning um okay so think about it. A tenth of a mil is 0.36 inches at 100 yards. So 0.2 would be 0.72. You just take 0.36 and multiply it. So 0.36 times 3. So basically, one MOA is, is point. It, 0.3 mils at 100. It's very important to say the distance because that can be huge. Okay, so 0.3 mils at 100. Somebody multiply 0.36 times three, and you're going to come up to something like one point something. That's how many mils it is, or MOAs it is. So that's roughly the same because you got to think about it. A tenth of a mil is a third of an inch at 100. Right. And you're saying three of those. It's going to be roughly the same. Yeah. I just know it's three clicks on that way and three clicks on mills for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Point um, three, I yeah. can't leave. If I leave this screen, I mean, I could I could give you the exact numbers. Right. Who's got a calculator? Here, yeah, I got one. What's, what's point three six times three? Point three six times three. Point three six times three yep. is one point zero eight. There you go. That right there is 1.08 inches at 100 mm -hmm. yards, okay? One MOA is one inch at 100 yards. It's almost identically the same. Yeah, because you said 0, 8, not 8. Especially when you say 1.047. We're getting even closer to that. So, yeah, it's a great question, conservative sniper hunter, but you have to always specify the distance because – as you go out further, you know, remember, one MOA at 300 yards is now three inches. If I've confused everybody, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, great information for sure.
Kenny, do you ever shoot a 185 grain bird? No, actually, the only ones I've shot so far are the one, uh, I think it's the 200 grain VLDs and then the 200.2 um, or 200.20 Xs. So that's a 200.2 grain burgers. I have not shot the 185s. Is there a difference in shooting uphill or downhill, long range, 500 yards plus, or extreme mountainous areas? <laughs> there is there is when you have wind. If you're shooting uphill, it causes an updraft. And when you're shooting downhill, it's not as far as, well, maybe the master will talk about it. I don't really notice a difference. My dope's been the same. I was about to say, did you boot the juice? Yep. Okay. Did what? Uh, Since you are the host, there was somebody that you needed to boot. I didn't know if you were aware of that, but he's gone now. Oh, I didn't see it. <laughs> maybe maybe TB or somebody blasted them. I don't even know if TB's in here still. I have to go uh, back. Yeah, I'm interested. Hmm. Fifty BMG. I don't know. <laughs> a, little, a little too philosophical for here. Twenty mic mic. I do. Yeah, I don't know the effective range either, but I will tell you, as a general world rule for your Barrett, you know, it depends on. It doesn't matter if it's a, the semi-automatic or whatever. They're not that accurate. Yes, you can get accurate ones, but they are not that consistent in what you're trying to hit. Right. Yes, there was a really good question. I missed it. Uh, is there a difference in shooting uphill or downhill, long range, 500 yards plus, or extreme mountainous areas? Absolutely. Uh, it's called slope dope. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> just remember this, Idaho Rogers and everyone else. It can't be like eight, nine degrees. Extreme mm -hmm. uphill or downhill. If you know exactly what your rifle zeroed at at 500 yards, if you're shooting extreme uphill or downhill, you will probably miss the target high. Okay. okay? Uh, we're not going to – Ken, you're going to agree or no, or do you do a whole lot? Yeah, of I was going to say, um, I'll, I'll think it more realistic. If you're just shooting towards a regular hill, you're only going to be canted maybe five degrees. I don't really notice much yeah. difference on that. But, yeah, exactly what you're saying – I do remember when I was back in my old house shooting downhill, I was like a negative 10, and that did make a big, big difference. Yeah, I don't even worry about it until I see anything above positive 10 or negative 10 degrees from right. horizontal, okay? Because at that distance, and you're like, wait a minute, how do I miss high? If I shoot downhill, gravity's working with me. Okay, so yes, this is all part of that big equation. I really need a whiteboard behind me, but I want to make this very <laughs> simple, guys. Coriolis. Doesn't matter if you're going uphill and shooting up against gravity, because a lot of people say, well, I'm shooting against gravity now. Well, no, it's still pulling on that bullet at the same rate that it pulls if you're going downhill. You just have to think of it that way. What you really need to think about is, is when you're when you shoot your rifle and it goes 500 yards on a flat surface. OK, let's we're just going to make up a number. Let's just say you're holding. Five mils, OK. Well, as you shoot uphill, that bullet, when it travels horizontally, if we're shooting uphill, it's only traveling this distance from the base of that. Let's so even though you measure with your range finder, you're holding five, five, I'm getting feedback. Sorry. If it's 500 yards this way, that bullet is only traveling horizontally about 400 yards. Now, it's affected by wind that entire 500-yard distance. Man, I really I need to show you on this right here. Okay, so here you are, Mr. Hunter. You're shooting at Mr. Elk up here. Okay, well, if you're shooting – yeah, there we go. If you're shooting uphill this way, the bullet only travels this distance coming straight down if you were to draw a line straight down. If you measure that, and you can use, like in high school, like when you use Pythagorean's theorem, C squared equals A squared plus B squared, oh, yeah. all of the math works. And even on Strelock, you can take a picture of your target. It will give you the angle of inclination or declination on that, and it will tell you what your dope needs to be, and it does adjust quite a bit. Sorry. 
No, it's good info for sure. I feel like there's going to be a whiteboard attached to Ray's house in the. All the time. <laughs> he explains very well. So. But tomorrow night there'll be a whiteboard attached to the side of the house. <laughs> no, not happening. My wife would kill me. <laughs> no, you just let her know it's for your neighbors. They can leave notes oh, without knocking on the door and, and bringing the. There you sword. go. We actually cover all of this in my class uh, for the long range shooting, the intermediate. It's not intermediate level. I just call it intermediate distance because I consider 700 yards and in intermediate, not long range, because you're not even on a five, five, six. If you're shooting 77 grains, you're still not going subsonic. So any or even getting into that transonic range where it's breaking in. So I call that intermediate range, long range. But we cover all of this in the classroom. Right. It's a great class. Uh, I'll let everyone know when it restarts because the first one was uh, off the hook. It was a good cool course. Get some of these guys that we talk to on the chat all the time to show up. It'd be cool. You know, Ray, I've already told you that whenever you're ready to do it and I can take a vacation, I will drive down there for it. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, Tim. I just, the community center has to reopen and it's owned by the fire department. And because of, governor's rulings and all that they're not allowed to reopen until they clear the state so without a classroom i'm not teaching under a tent outside and we do it right awesome. yeah fresh fowler absolutely right especially if you're a bow hunter and you're way up in a tree it'll figure that out for you and i think he commented earlier it will compensate and he said he has to shoot like you know uses 10 yards less of dope for it because you will shoot over the top of it HRM, he is. He does a good job for sure. The bullet weight question. Yep. Better get ready, Kenny. Get your charts and shit out. <laughs> I got my calculator. Me and Tim are just going to sit here and wait. I got a calculator too. We'll do the calculator. Uh, yeah, something crazy. Let me see. I got some data here. Does, does, do you get name tags, Ray? Uh, actually, you don't get a name tag. What we, we do do a little sticker and we put it on the back of your hat or on the back between your shoulder blades because uh, when you're laying on the ground, everybody looks the same. So <laughs> it's like I got to know who Tim or Nick or everyone is. And if, if I see this guy in the wrong position or doing something wrong, I can immediately say Nick, Tim. Uh, we had – uh, it was a 13 or 15 people in the last class, but I had enough instructors and it went well, no problem whatsoever, but you're not going to be able to remember everyone's name that quickly on the fly. <laughs> Page time, Brian, for sure. Uh, Brian, it is uh, from 8 a.m. to about 1130. It is classroom, very involved classroom. And then from then until five, it is all range time. Nice. My name is. My name is. Slim Shady. Slim Shady. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm waiting on the bullet weight question from Otter. <laughs> yeah, Otter. We're all ready. <laughs> so I, 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 I heard uh, Ken mention something about a 20 millimeter. 20 mic, mic. Yeah, 20 mic, mic. Yep. I might have stood pretty close to one of those ripping off. <laughs> ripping off. All the time. Yeah. I got tired of handling. Actually, it was funny. Oh, hold on. What's the minimum caliber? There we go. There you go. So did you have to that <coughs> you didn't have to dose center when you were around those, did you? What was that? I didn't catch that. Uh, uh, you didn't have to wear a dosimeter around those, do you? No, I did when, not. So when I was in the Navy, um, we we had two phalanx uh, sea whizzes, which were the twenty millimeter uh, uh, Vulcan Gatling guns, and yep. um, we used the depleted uranium uh, tipped rounds. So those those had to have uh, any time you were handling ammunition, for those you had to wear uh, dosimeters. Um, I know we started wearing like a lead flat jacket. Um, but we're loading these in the, the clips. So, um, I will be back and we'll some tea. Now, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if they're still using depleted uranium. 
um, in the military. And since I've been out, I know other branches have picked up the, uh, the sea whiz, uh, to use them. Yeah. No, we load a lot, a lot of tracers and you know, every third round was the tracer. So I, I, I don't remember wearing a dissimilator, a dissimilator or whatever. So, um, All right, here's that question. Measure my barrel twist with a cleaning rod and an old 308. I think it's a 1 in 12. What would be my max bullet weight for ELR? It really all depends, man. You just really got to try out you know, certain rifles just like certain bullets and certain weights. It just There's a lot of variables in that from what I know. I, I have a, a neighbor that has a Barrett. Uh, 96B, I believe, and that's in a 1 in 12, and that one likes the 185s for some reason. But I have a, another 308 in 1 in 12, but it will not shoot one in, or a 185 at all. It likes the 168s. So. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, um, I, I'm going to answer this because this was this was a brain twister. So conservative sniper hunter, and like I said, I can't read the comment now. I'm just doing this from recollection. He said, you're standing on a ridge, shooting into a valley. The target is 700 yards away. He said, the wind is at six miles an hour where you're shooting and at 10 miles an hour at the target, but halfway, it's 35 miles an hour. What is your wind hold? Easy. <laughs> Zero, because if it's coming right at you or away from you, it's zero. <laughs> so <laughs> you would hope for a 12 or 6 o'clock wind in that estimate. And seriously, I'm going to answer yeah. your question. Um, the, and it, once again, it's going to be a wild-ass guest. Um, basically, you're shooting at a 700-yard target. You didn't tell me how much declination I've got shooting into that valley. And I have shot under these conditions and worse uh, out in Wyoming, uh, New Mexico, and you're shooting on these ridge tops and you got these canyons. And that's exactly what happens. The winds will swirl. And if it's blowing at 20, 30 miles an hour, you've got to do your best. And these are small targets, too. So six miles an hour here, 10 miles an hour at the target and 35 midways. Now, the key question is, is which direction is the wind coming from? That is, I need to know that information. Is it a full value wind, meaning it's coming from three o'clock or nine o'clock? Mm -hmm. uh, is it all the same wind? There's a lot of unanswered questions, but I need things answered before I can answer that question. Right, Ken? <laughs> yeah, you just, yep. You put all the calculations together. <laughs> yep. Calculations. Calculations. But you wouldn't figure your dope for 700 yards either because if you're shooting downhill and it's really steep, remember, it's going to be less than that 700 yards that you hit it with the rangefinder. If the rangefinder says 700, great. But that bullet will be affected for that entire 700-yard length. Yeah. But that will not be your dope. It'll be 600 and some change probably. For the dope. Well, all right, we got he seven says, ha, ha, ha. We got seven minutes. This has been a great chat. It always is. It's, it's a good thing uh, Ray knows be betters on here. No, I don't <laughs> know. Jumper. No, not this, no I, and I don't We're ever talking about to be just me. That's why I like, I, I like <laughs> to have – yeah, I'm glad Ken came up. I need some backup on this. <laughs> well, you're saying me and Tim don't know yeah. anything, which is obviously part of the Ray. I'm saying Tim doesn't Rick, know what, anything. Rick, what's the furthest you've shot, brother? One thousand. That answers the question right there. But you're shooting one thousand on smaller targets, ten inch plates, and all that. So that makes no. a huge difference. How many That's times that. has he shot a thousand? How many times have I shot at a thousand or shot a thousand? Yes. <laughs> There's shot a difference. At a thousand. You're not listening to the words. How many times have I shot at a thousand or shot a thousand? actually shot the distance of trying to hit a target at a thousand yards that's uh, a few times probably three or four times and uh yeah and that's was... it and it was a very short amount of time yeah right now we're getting you all dialed in at 700 700 in dude you're you're all over it i got a lot of faith in you 
but there's a lot that happens that additional 300 yards to a thousand when wind calls and all that start yeah. happening. I just need to know. I just need to know what my Kestrel HUD says. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah, but you got, and you're, you're doing, you're good. You still, you're remembering the fundamentals and the basics and keeping the data book. So that's a good thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, your Kestrel, your HUD will go out one day when you need it. So, speaking of the notebooks, <laughs> Rick, are you still keeping your notebook? Yeah, I'm doing. Actually, I have it right here, and it keeps getting fatter. Uh, the one thing I'm really glad I did is use those two inch stickies. You know, those little targets I use these ones. Yeah. I, so I, I guess I, I have the question is, is with all the technology that's available now, Kestrels, Strelock, things like that, is that notebook as important as it was 10 years ago when you, you didn't have as much Absolutely. information readily available? I know it's a, it's a record specifically of your gun and, you know, like the rounds that you fire and the, and the, the variables that go into it, but I didn't know if it, played as much of a role in it today as it did 10 years ago. One of the most important pages I think on here is I was going to try to find it to show you. It's in the front of the book and it's, it's this one and you won't see much information on here because I use two pages, but it all has to do with temperature. And I, I do a little bit of other stuff to it, but I know it's 70, 70 degrees temperature, 40 degrees, 30 degrees, stuff that I've shot in. This is going to be pretty damn spot on. Unless it's, you know, super foggy or something weird, not like the normal 70 degree day. But I, I have the ability, if I didn't have anything, I could use this sheet and probably pull off a hit at Unless it's extreme temperature, something I haven't shot in yet, like you know, 110 degrees out in in, in Kenny's area in Arizona, or like in you know uh, Iceland or some Greenland, I guess is where the ice is, and Iceland is green, so, um, in Iceland or Greenland, somewhere like super different. Well, I guess the argument's always there that in the event that you know the the Kestrel breaks and the, and your uh, iPhone breaks. And, and uh, that's the only thing you've got to go with. It's, it's better to, I guess, to have that data than not having it at all. You know, honestly, that's right. Cause you will not know those numbers. You cannot retain all those numbers. Not going to happen. You know what? Oh no. <laughs> Did we lose the host? Oh, oh, my host. System, <laughs> oh. There he is. There I am on a, on a, these I kind of have set up. They're little dope cards that I keep prior to having the uh, Kestrel and that stuff. So, like, on this one, it's this was April 9th. So I know in the April time of season I could use this one or, or some of the other ones that I have. You know, it kind of give me some information as well if I, I could kind of grab a couple of these depending on the weather. Yeah. You know, another good thing that you guys are honestly doing is you're out there every, almost every weekend practicing. You know, you just get familiar every day. <laughs> every day, yeah, exactly. You know, unfortunately, some folks don't have the ability to do that. But if you do, the more you shoot your rifle, the more you just familiarize yourself. Like, like in, for instance, uh, he called out your 700 yard dope, and you knew it by heart. You know what it was for your rifle. So, Five forty one at seven hundred yards. Yeah, so to me, the biggest factor is is to go out there and which, with what you got and see what you could do and just see how repeatable you could be. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. My AI in 6.5 Creedmoor, I don't have enough experience in 6mm Creedmoor to know this in my memory, but I know that a 1,000 yards, and Rick's been out there with, with me every single time. Have I ever missed the 1,000-yard 10 by 10 steel first shot cold bore? Never. That is my goal. When I go out there, I open up all my rifles, boom, I take a look at everything, figure out where it's at, first shot hit, 10 by 10 steal every time. And then and I can tell you, 
Yeah. No, not always. And it's, I don't mean this, and I don't take it as that I'm bragging. I'm saying it's being familiar with that rifle and knowing what it can do. However, if it's winter, dead of winter, and it's 30 degrees outside, I can tell you my dope with 6.5 Creedmoor, 147 grain ELD match, is going to be about 8.1 mils. That's what it's going to be. But I can go out there in the summer, like tomorrow, let's say it's 80 degrees out, I'm going to be about 7.3 mils. That's a lot of change. Now, when I shot, the last time I shot in Logan, New Mexico, the day before we flew out, we shot at the thousand yard range and my dope was like 7.6 or something like that at a thousand. When I landed in Amarillo, drove to uh, Logan, my dope was seven mils flat. The very next day, we're talking six tenths of a mil, which is huge when you're talking about a target. <laughs> I mean, you're over half a mil, you're going to definitely blow it over or under one way or the other. And this all gets into that air density altitude, especially the barometric pressure, pressures I've never seen in the East Coast. OK, um, your barometric pressure, you're typically what, 25 ish, 26, Ken? Yeah, I'm like 26, almost 27 over here. Yeah, I haven't seen 26. In I don't know how long. Every time I call it out to Rick, it's going to be 28, 28, 89, somewhere in there. It's just different uh, how that bullet flies through the air. Yeah, we don't have any. Rain here. You know, when I when I moved here, like we get a lot of times we get humidity in the single digits during summer. You know, top fire season time when shit half the world's burning down. And uh, out here, I mean, right now, well, it's not. It's raining, so it's ninety nine percent. But it's always freaking humid. But you don't you don't notice it. But it's always a lot thicker than. Right. If you were to go out west, yeah, and you guys got the bullet weight. Okay, I don't have any bullet weight yeah, out here. Auto, real quick, he says. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ken. My bad. No, sorry. Just, just yeah, we don't have any, yeah, we don't. We don't have any bullet weight, so we can't rely on having a bullet weight out here. It's all impacts. Gotcha. The bullet what? The the wake, the little ripple. Oh, gotcha. Oh, so you're not seeing any of that? Not at all. Not cutting. cutting you don't air. see trace. No, only if I'm like early in the morning, like ass crack of dawn, I go out there and I fire right at like six thirty. It's a lot denser. Yeah. The stratosphere is pushing down. That's when I can see a little bit. Gotcha. Yeah, because even in New Mexico, I was seeing trace, but it was a lot harder. Uh, Otter's question was, your Kestrel uses applied ballistics, but you guys are using Strelock. Does not add up for me. No, I use both, and it's whatever's convenient. Look, I love my Kestrel, and in a competition, I'm going to have my Kestrel out. But if I'm out shooting with Rick, I'm just going to look at the Strelock data or look at my notebook or whatever because I'll have my phone with me. I never take a phone to a competition because it will overheat or the battery will die. I never rely on a phone. It's horrible. Um, that should not be something you shoot a match with, although I have done it before. Um, and I do know there are two different ballistic apps, but Strelock is just so intuitive. And if you don't have time, like Rick's just now learning a Kestrel and applied ballistics inside of it, it's just whatever works. They're always going to be pretty darn close anyway. I do know that the Strelock, cause I've been messing with it a lot and the applied ballistics i really like straight lock over applied ballistics seems much user friendlier that's it that's it <clears throat> and, uh, and and guys don't mistake because kevin made a comment about you know i shoot you know so many rounds by noon every day it's like yesterday <laughs> i worked all day long rick was doing stuff when we got off work he met here at like he i called him i was like dude i'm leaving work right now i'll be home in 20 minutes because we wanted to get some training time in and we were able to we stayed out there till dark and that's when the jumpy sharpie challenge happened because it was like you can't shoot anymore it's dark <laughs> it's dark yeah uh so yeah we you know with him committing to shooting that match with me um i'm not gonna lie to you i'm not gonna show up with someone that's not ready for that match that wouldn't be fair to him and it's definitely not gonna be fair to me because you got plane tickets you got hotel the entry fee is six hundred dollars <laughs> so um is that I'm a person or a team him, him team up team yeah it's a team yeah and i don't, I don't know what to... i'm saying and it's all about communication and i don't want to let him down either i mean i i have a lot i have a lot of uh needing and wanting of not going out there and looking like an asshat and 
that, you know, like Ray said, you know, there's a lot of money involved and invested and I don't want to, you know, not do good or not be prepared. Basically there's a still a point that I could not do well, but if I do what I'm trying to do right now, I think by October I'll be okay. You know, and I, I actually, I'm going to have to learn a new platform of a gun. So I don't know if Ray talked about that at all, but. Yeah, so for this match, he's actually going to shoot either the 6.5 Grendel or my 5.56 with the 77 TM case. Um, he will shoot secondary. Um, I think that will take a lot of pressure off of him, uh, unlike the one that I shot with Bryson where I shot secondary and then Bryson shot primary. Um, I'll be the bolt gunner because I'll only get one shot per target. There's no follow-up shots whatsoever. And so I don't want Rick to have that pressure because it's really easy for somebody on a bolt gun you know, your secondary gets six hits, six points. And then the primary, let's say, just misses, 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 misses. You only get one shot at it, and you got to move on to a different target, a different distance, different win value. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take primary. He'll shoot secondary, so he's got to learn a new platform. And, but it'll have a trimmer three on it, so we'll speak the same language. Yeah. So I, sometime between now and then, I really need to run that optic, get used to that optic. <clears throat> and uh, I don't want, I'm not going there to just go there. I'm really trying. And I always have in the past. I'm actually going to actually compete, like be a contender and, and try to do well, like really well. So, yeah, when Rick first got into three gun and I met him, I could tell he liked shooting, but he wasn't there for the competition aspect of it. He was there to have fun hone his skills, but he didn't really care where he finished. He just wanted to shoot well. He has made that conscious decision. I want to be a competitor, not a participator in this event. Okay, that's what I get out of it. Because he is putting in the time, and I'll give him kudos for that. Um, you know, this whole C-19 thing just kind of worked out where he could dedicate a lot of time to it. But, yeah, I mean, he should do well. Or at least I'll make sure he does well. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to cover them. <laughs> Dude, Ray, you're going to do good, man. I, I can already tell. I mean, just going off to some of the competitions I've been there, you're a hell of a lot more advanced than the folks I've seen. So you're you're going to do well. Well, I appreciate that. But, I mean, I, I have been doing it a long time, but I enjoy it. You know, somebody did ask, $600, what's the prize table? You know, on some of these events, guys, these prize tables can get very, very large, okay? Um very large. Uh, it's nothing to pull like a night force scope off the table or pull, you know, a certificate for a Thunder Beast suppressor, which is good for anything, which, you know, might be, you know, $1,500 if you're, you know, wanting to get one of those cans. You're typically going to leave with more than what you have invested if you shot well and communicated well. Now, if you just went out there and you were just, you know, grab ass and you didn't care and you finished last, yeah, you're probably going to win a $50 <laughs> squeeze bag or something like that. You know, at least you'll get something. And people say, well, it's not about the prize table. I go for the competition. Bullcrap. Yeah. You know, when you spend 300, if I spend 300 and Rick spends 300, I at least want to take something that I'll keep and I remember from that match. For me, yeah. anyway. I want that. Uh, it's not a cash payout match. Yeah, it's a memory, you know. Yeah. I want a trophy, damn it. Yeah, yeah. well, this match. That is not my goal. I will tell you that. Uh, <laughs> the one we're going to be shooting in is, is no joke. And I know that's not the right attitude to have, but I'm also a realist. I know a lot of the competitors out there. I've shot against them, and there are some really strong-ass teams. Strong teams. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you'll have, you'll have Team Proof out there. You'll have Team Steiner. Uh, all of your big-name two-man teams will be out there. And... Honestly, it's not enough time to get them up to speed. Yeah. We got some cheap asses out here. We don't have any prizes. <laughs> so. You could be the first one to start it off with some uh, of those uh, shooting square things. Yeah. Or a camera. Like, uh, or a camera or something. I don't know. These guys are old. They're retired. You know, I call them. They got their uh, old silverbacks with gold stacks, but they never spend it. So, yeah. How many shooters will be participating in the upcoming match? Well, those are 
October is going to be really crazy for me. I just got my schedule today. Uh, the the second week of October, I will be shooting in the Memorial Three Gun. That's a three day event. I'll come home, and then Rick and I will fly out like two days later to Texas, drive to New Mexico. We will shoot the or, uh, Logan, New Mexico. We'll shoot that match. That's a three day event. I'll fly back and then I have to go to Snipers Unknown that weekend. So it's like two more days. That's the one I'm shooting with Malali, right? Yes. So you're going to be part of that schedule as well, but you won't be shooting Memorial Three Gun, which can be a brutal match. That's three day, three long days. Yeah. I might show up to that anyways. Bradley's back in action. Yeah, see, and, you know, that's another thing, like Memorial Three Gun, you know, I, you know, I documented that whole thing. You know, that's where I pulled that loophole that uh, Mark 4 M5. Yeah. yeah, and I actually <laughs> sold that to Bryson at a really, really good price, and that's what he competed with because he needed an optic, and he liked it. It was a great optic, had a great reticle. Um, but it, it is all about going out there and having fun. It really is. Are we yeah. going to be near El Paso, or are we flying into El Paso? No, we'll fly into Amarillo and then drive up to Logan, New Mexico. Amarillo by morning. Yeah, it's funny, Rick. I was thinking that same thing, too. <laughs> Go George Strait. That's it. Otter says, I'm sure you'll do great. I hope so. I'm going to try my hardest. After yesterday's practice, I was like, holy crap. Now, that match you cover, the one we're going to do in Logan, New Mexico, you'll cover about 13 miles. Uh, but it's not like a ruck match like what Bryce and I did. You do have to carry everything, and you are rucking it, but there's no time hack. Meaning, you can't walk and lollygag, but it's not taxing where you've got to make the time hack. And if you're not here at this amount of time, then you're disqualified. Yeah, there was one race. You can walk, you're good. If you can walk with your load, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We are at two minutes, two hours, two minutes, two hours and 12 minutes. Right on. Hey, Ray, you got a second to stay back? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Will you be right, videoing? Great chat. I hope you learned something. We hope to do some videoing of some sort, but oh, man. we will. Now we that will. I have a GoPro, yeah, I'll be wearing it. <laughs> nice. All right, you guys, I appreciate it. We're gonna say goodbye. Thanks um, to everyone for watching. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you for all the great questions. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You guys were awesome. Mm -hmm. Levi Otter, MCK, conservative sniper hunter, Bradley. Appreciate you showing back up. Let's see, Otter. Who did I miss? I know there's a bunch. Armament and Axes, TB, Chico Wise, Eagle Eye Shooting. I don't know who that guy is. Let's see. <laughs> David from the lead. Appreciate you showing up. And I'm not going to keep scrolling. Last Andy won. Um, but appreciate it. So thanks again. You guys take care. See you on the next one. Lead Mining 44, night. I didn't even see you in here at all. You must have just got here. Or you're being a stealthy little ninja. But um, Redneck Prepper, Tony, thank you, thank you. Orion Fixer. All right, you guys, take care. John, thanks for showing us. You're going to love that rifle. Mm -hmm.